blessing to be here with you all this morning. I am thankful for the opportunity that God has given me. Again, as we talked about two years ago, I was here, but I was not able to visit your church. I was in a camp, and I realized I was only here for a few, um, I don't know, a few few days because I need to go back. I have some pastoral duties in Jakarta. I was a pastor in Jakarta for two years. And after that, the Lord impressed me to leave pastoral work and to be a full-time missionary in the field, the front line. So um, that's what I've been doing. And the Lord has led me back in Australia. I'm very happy for this opportunity. Last week, I was in a church called 3 a.m. Church. Uh, we were in an Easter camp with them. And so God has brought me here. Um, leaving tomorrow. Uh, to Perth, and then uh, I have a trip with my cousin from uh, a place called Karatha, driving up to Darwin. To uh, yeah, it's a big trip for ten days in a van. So I'm really, I'm really excited on that. That's my, that's my uh, break time. It's not doesn't sound like a break time, but yeah, it's a break time from the ministry. We're ministering to people, and now we can, we can uh, uh, talk to God in literally in the wilderness. So I'm really happy with that. Um, opportunity. Let us pray and then we will start. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us an opportunity this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open the word. We are excited, Father, to study your word today, but please give us more spirit from above. I pray for the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to teach us, Lord, the things that you want us to know this morning. Take away all the distractions in our hearts and mind, that our hearts, Lord, we focus to you today. I pray, Father, that the angels will guard over us, and may Jesus Christ himself will come and sit beside us. Bless us, Lord, with your spirit. Change us that this message will not just be a mere message, will be a life-changing message, Father, I pray for each and every one of us, that when we go out of this church, we will never be the same. We would change into the image and glory of Jesus Christ. That our, the people around us, Lord, would see Jesus Christ in us and our life would testify that we have been with Jesus this Sabbath. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Do you have your Bibles with you? Yes, praise the Lord. The title of our topic this morning is the, A Soldier or a Colonist. I have two titles in the sermon. I'm sorry I did not change the title, but it's the same thing technically. A Soldier or a Colonists. If you have your Bibles with you, please open it with me in the book of Second Timothy. Is it working or no? Do you have a wireless mic? No. So I'm stuck here. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, I usually like to move, but I will bear because the mic is here. Okay, good. Um, let's open the Bibles in the book of Second Timothy. Second Timothy. What book is that, everyone? Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Let's open our Bibles there. 2 Timothy, by the way, is the last book of Paul to the young Timothy. Now, Paul is in prison during this time. And let me just give you a little context here. It was AD 69, if my history still is right here. AD 69, there was a fire in the south part of Rome, a place called um, Circus Maximus. It was on fire. And it's over three-fourths of Rome, if I'm not mistaken, was burning. It was burning for about six days. The fire is just too strong for people to quench. Story was told that historians, you can read, read it in some history books, that Nero was accused of burning the city. I don't know if you are in the era before of uh, CDs and DVDs. There's a software in a computer called Nero Burner. I think that was inspired because Nero burned Rome. Anyways, what happened was Nero, the people start to accuse him, and historians accused him of burning Rome because he wanted to build a statue for himself in that area, which he did a few years after the burning. And so what happened was, Nero, if you're a king or an emperor of a certain city or a country, you don't want your people to revolt against you. That's a horrible idea. And so what he did was, he started to divert people's attention and accuse a small minority during that time in Rome called the Christians. The who, everyone? The Christians. And so he starts to persecute them and telling everyone that they were the ones burning up Rome. So he got a hold of a leader of these Christians. His name was the Apostle Paul. And he puts him in a dungeon. And so Paul here was stuck in that dungeon. Probably God has given Providence a pen and a paper and a lamp to write in a dungeon and to write his final words to someone. And he chose his final letter 
to be sent to the young Timothy. Now, if you're in the point of your death, right? You're gonna die, you know you're next to be beheaded, and you're given a last chance to, to, to share your final words to someone, would that, be, would that final words be a serious, full of serious uh, counsels? Yeah, if I'm given a last chance to speak to someone before I die, that would be the most serious thing that could ever share to someone. I will not be joking around. And so this book is not a joke. This book is filled with serious counsel. So Paul here knows that he's about to end his ministry. And so this young Timothy is about to continue his ministry. He's passing the baton to the young Timothy and giving him advice. This book is so powerful. Now remember, Paul was writing this in a dungeon. Now, how many of you have been to Rome or some areas in Europe where there are dungeons? Anyone have tried? It's, a not, it's, it's, it's not a nice place, yeah? It's not a nice place that we used to, you know, when you, when you think about dungeon, you probably think about a prison. But it's sort of a different one. They carved up a, they, like a hole in the mountain, the side of the mountain, and literally there's no light passing through that, mount, that, that, that hole. Some of the dungeons has no toilet. It's dirty. And probably all the noise they could hear is just rats everywhere and the curses and the chains of other pre people's uh, prisoners inside. So this is a very discouraging place. Not a very nice place to be at to write a letter of, of, of encouragement to someone. But notice the introduction here. As Paul gives introduction to people, and he always says similar introduction to everyone. First, uh, Second Timothy chapter one. Let's look at verse 1. The Bible said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, to who everyone? Amen. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is, fascinates me the most, the next words. He said, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, with without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Notice how close Timothy and Paul is. Paul mentions or remembers Timothy in his prayers night and day. Now think about someone in your life today that you mention in your prayers night and day. Might be your wife. If you're not praying for your wife, that's a sh you're, in, you're in trouble. <laughs> You're probably your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? So Paul here is, is, is saying, hey, I always pray for you. And every time I pray, I remember you. But notice the words of Paul here. He said, I thank God. Notice how thankful Paul is. Where was Paul when he was writing this letter again? But notice the introduction of Paul. He said, I thank God. There's no complaints. You know, we're living in a generation where we love to complain, especially millennials. We love to complain how our salary is, how low a salary is, you know, how we're not taken care of. We just love to complain. And you, if you go to Facebook, you probably, your Facebook wall is probably filled with people's complaints. But Paul here is under pressure. He's not in a very good situation. And yet he said, I thank God. When I read that, I was so challenged. I realized that Christianity is not only measured in prosperity. Christianity arises even amidst adversity. Paul was praising God amidst the darkest time of his life. I thank God for you, Timothy. What about you? Are you a Christian in calamity or only in prosperity? I remember Daniel in his story, The Lion's Den. He was thrown into the lion's den. If you remember that story, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And so while he was in the lion's den, I was curious of what the feeling of Daniel was. And so I, I read a book, Patrick's in, uh, Prophet and Kings by Ellen White. And so in that book, Ellen White said, in the situation of Daniel, she said, Daniel in the lion's den was the same Daniel in the king's palace. Wow. And I read that, wow. Daniel was the same Daniel in the lion's den and the same Daniel in the king's palace. Wherever you put Daniel, my dear friends, he is the same Daniel. You know, many Christians today, 
they change and they, they lose track of their faith whenever they are in trials. But Paul, my dear friends, and all these people in the Bible, they're still hanging on to God, praising God amidst whatever situation God has put them to be in. I remember a quotation from Mrs. White. I hope I could still memorize it. She said, circumstances should not allow to shape the man. But we should use circumstances in which we could work. And she said, it should not allow to, we should master circumstances, but should not allow it to master us. So whatever situation we may have, it may not affect us as Christians. And so Paul had the situation, friends. And so as we fast forward, I hope I could study with you the whole, the whole book of 2 Timothy, but we don't have any time. So let's just jump into 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So Paul said, I thank you, Timothy, for you are a faithful son. But notice what it says here. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy. Paul now is giving Timothy tips on how to become a good soldier. Counsels. Because he's giving the baton to the young Timothy, he's giving him that counsel. Now notice what it says here as his counsel. Verse 1 of chapter 2. And if you're there, let me know by saying amen. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible said in verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. They probably have a new King James Version. I, I love to read the King James. So this sermon was studied in the King James. So you still memorize it. So I apologize, but I hope you could still follow on this one. Verse 3. This is where we focus now. Just two verses. Verse 3. The Bible said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. So that was the counsel of Paul to the young Timothy. Again, Paul is about to die and he said, Timothy, God has called you to be a soldier. Today, we're going to study some of the principles that Paul has given. We're going to unpack these verses and we're going to see what are the principles, what does it take to become a good soldier. We believe as Christians that we are called by God to be soldiers. Amen? We believe that, right? We're not just called to be members. We're called to be soldiers for Jesus. And we do believe that. And so Paul's giving us this counsel on how to become a good soldier. If you have a pen and a paper, we are going to study on how to become a good soldier. Simple tips. Just four tips or counsels on how to become a good soldier. Number one. Paul said, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. What he's saying is that, Timothy, God has called you to be a soldier. So number one, if you want to be a soldier for God or a good soldier, first step is you need to understand that you must answer the call. That's number one. A good soldier must answer the call. So if you want to good, be a good soldier, number one, you need to answer the call. You need to answer the what, everyone? Answer the call. We're living in a generation where people like to profess to be someone. But when a call is given, they don't want to answer the call. I've seen people wear the uniform of the military. They're proud of it. But they don't want to join into the military into battle. They just want to wear it. And many people in the church loves to wear the logo of the church, the name of the church, but they don't want to engage in the work of the church. How many years is God calling you to do something? And how many years have you been delaying that call? You see, every one of us has been called by God to do something for Him, big or small, but God has called us to do something. The question is, have you answered the call? Or is the phone still ringing? Maybe for many years, God has been calling us to do something here in Australia. And yet maybe we have been ignoring that call. You will never become a good soldier if you haven't even answered the call of becoming a soldier. So today, before we begin and proceed, my dear friends, we need to answer this question. Have you answered that call? Or is the Lord still calling you? You know, sometimes when you wake up, and I do have an alarm with my phone, and you know, I'm a type of person that when I put an alarm, I put, uh, for example, wake up 4 a.m., 
4 a.m., 4.10, 4.15, 4.20. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm like that when I'm, I put an alarm. And sometimes, whenever I'm so tired and I can't wake up, I put on the snooze button. Have you tried putting that snooze button? Every time it rings out snooze. Rings out snooze, snooze. And you know what happens? You become numb and you sleep through the alarm. And many Christians have been pressing the snooze button that they've been sleeping through the call of God. Have you been pressing the snooze button of God's call in your life today? Because if you do, you can't become a good soldier. Today we need to ignite that call. Have you answered the call of God? That's number one. Remember that. In order for us to become a good soldier, we need to answer the call. Because many are soldiers, members, friends, but very few missionaries. You know, it's no longer, here I am, Lord. You always say, here I am, Lord, send him. <laughs> Isn't that the reality of the church, you know? Here I am, Lord, send my pastor. <laughs> pastor, I need you I need to give Bible study here. I need some help. You're right? That's what's happening. We are so accustomed to just waiting for our pastors. We like to send people. But when God calls us personally, we keep on delaying. So number one, we need to understand that we need to answer the call. Number two, let's read verse two, uh, verse three. This is number two now. Let's look at verse three. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus. So number, number one, when we answer the call of God, Paul said, as you answer that call, you need to endure hardness. Now notice the magnitude of the words that Paul used here in the New King James. Can you read the New King James for me, uh, Pastor Tim? What does the New King James say? NIV too. Can you read the NIV? So four? Yeah, no, the three one. Oh, that's intense. Now listen to that. In, in, in King James is a little bit mild, but that one is intense. Paul said, join me in my suffering as a good soldier. In other translation, you need to endure hardness. You must endure hardness. Now notice that. The magnitude of that is so heavy that Paul did not say, look, Timothy, when you answer the call of God, I'm not saying you might endure hardness. What I'm saying is, you will endure hardness. There's a mild difference between might endure and will endure. That means hardness will come. It's not a question of, will I have hardness? The question is, when will I have hardness? As you answer the call of God, hardness must be expected. In fact, he echoes the same words in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 12. If you have your Bibles with you, 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 12, the Bible said, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is intense. She said, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It did not say may or might suffer persecution. A result of faithfulness is persecution. Now when I was a little bit younger, uh, I remember teachers would teach us, you know, in the Bible, Job was tested to see if he's faithful. You know, they always teach that. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den to see if he's faithful or not. The three Hebrew boys was thrown into the fire to see if they're faithful or not. But I realized this, Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, and all these people in the Bible were persecuted not to see if they're faithful, but because they were faithful. I'll repeat that again. The, the characters in the Bible were not persecuted to see if they're faithful. They were persecuted because they are faithful. Persecution was a result of their faithfulness. And Paul said, those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Is it possible that the reason why we're not suffering persecution because we're not living a godly life? That's just heavy to bear, huh? But that's the reality. Is it possible that we are not under the attack of the devil? It's because he sees us not a threat against his kingdom, but people who builds up their kingdom. Notice this, my dear friends, a quotation from the book Great Controversy. Who may have read the book Great Controversy so far? If you haven't read the book, you're missing big time. 
Listen up. Please read that book. Amazing book. Listen to this. The early Christians, this is from the Great Controversy, the early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual, what everyone? Reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. And she goes on to say, they hate the purity which reveals and condemns their sin. And they persecute and destroy those who would urge upon them its just and holy claims. It is in this case, because the, of the exalted truth, it brings occasion, hatred, and strife, that the gospel is called a sword. The people in the time of Paul, in the, in the, the, the times of persecution, were so faithful that their lives was a continual offense to those people who lives not according to the lives of the word of God. And so they were persecuted. And so notice this, why is it then the persecution seem in a great degree to sleep or slumber? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. Let there be a renewal, revival of faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. That's deep. What she's saying is the reason why we're not persecuted just like the Christians before in the early times, because we've been living our lives just like the world. Wow. When I read that, it pricked my heart. Is it possible that the devil is not interested in disturbing us? It's because our lives has been helping him build his own kingdom. I remember... You know, in the church, I don't know, in the church here, but in some churches in Jakarta, especially in my church, we have testimony times. And I remember a story of an old man who goes to church every Sabbath. And every time there's a testimony, man, a testimony time, this old man will come up to the stage, right? He would give testimonies. But his testimonies will be the same every single Sabbath. He come up, gets the microphone, tells the same testimony. Next Sabbath, tells the same testimony. Tells the same testimony. People got tired of it. Because every time he comes up in the front, got his microphone, he would always say, oh, my dear friends, this week was tough. I met Satan on the road. But God gave me victory to overcome him. Praise the Lord. He would sit down every Sabbath. Next Sabbath, oh, I met Satan again on that road, friends. God gave me power to overcome him. Someone got tired of it in the pew. He stood up and said, you're giving all the, the same testimony every Sabbath. I came to the same road, but I've never met Satan. <laughs> the old man said, well, probably you. You're going the same direction as him. Uh, it's probably the same thing, yeah? Probably the reason why we are no, don't, not having conflicts with Satan is because we probably have the same direction. You see, when you oppose him, you rub against, say you meet him on the road. And so are, is our lives, friends, a continual offense against satan this is what god wants us to have in our lives my dear friends so that's number two endure hardness and this is the reality friends when you come into the work of god it's difficult there are going to be hardness in life as an evangelist i felt this it's difficult to work for god there's a lot of trials a lot of loneliness in this work you've been giving and giving to people and sometimes you don't have time for yourself. And so you become lonely. You miss your family. You miss your dog. Your personal bed. You miss everything. Your mom's cooking. There's a lot of things that you miss. But Paul said, as good soldiers, you must endure hardness. You will experience this. Jesus experienced loneliness. He experienced all these things. Paul did. But they have a goal. And that is to endure hardness Till Jesus comes. Maybe God has given you opportunities to go through trials. Maybe Satan is testing you right now in your life. Maybe there are some troubles in your life. Family issues, financial problems. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, friends. Paul is saying and giving us counsel today. Hang on. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Soon enough, the time will come when our commander comes and get us from this world. And soon enough, a time will come that there'll be no more death and no more crying. We'll all be rejoicing, but we are now on a battlefield. We must endure hardness. Amen? 
There'll be dangers. My brother Tim just mentioned about uh, our, this young man in, in, in Indonesia. He got killed. I was there two years ago. These missionaries are faithful missionaries. But he was murdered. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes God may allow that to happen for some reasons I do not know right now. I cannot explain. But we are soldiers. Sometimes there are casualties. But we need to be faithful and hang on to the promise that soon enough our Savior will come. Amen? But we must stick to the calling that God has given us. So that's number two. Endure hardness. Let's look at number three. As you answer the call, young Timothy, as you endure hardness, young Timothy, remember in verse four, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now let's pause there. Paul said this, young Timothy, you've answered the call. You've endured hardness. You need to endure hardness. But remember, a good soldier is not entangled by the things of this life. Can you give me some, the, the King, New King James version of that? What is his name? New King James. Good soldier is not what? Entangled also in the New King James? What does it say in New King James? Entangled also? Yeah, good. So a good soldier here, just like the New King James, is not entangled by the things of this life. Let me illustrate this on a Bible verse. What does it mean to be entangled by the things of this life? Let's open up, open up Bibles in the book of Numbers, chapter 31. If you have your Bibles with you, open your Bibles in the book of Numbers. What book is that, everyone? Numbers chapter 31. Put your ribbon on 2 Timothy. We'll go back there. Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. And if you're there, let me know by saying amen. Numbers chapter 31. The Bible said in verse 1. Uh, Numbers chapter 32, I'm sorry. Next chapter. Numbers chapter 32. The Bible said, And now the children of Reuben and the children of God had a very great multitude of cattle. Now before we, we begin on this, by the way, let me just give you a little context on this. The children of Israel was called by God on a specific assignment. And that is to go to a land. What was, that call, what was the land called again? What was the land called? The assignment that God has given them to conquer? Children of Israel. The promised land or... Canaan, right? So as they journey on, they were given that assignment, specific assignment, and that is to conquer the promised land. No other assignment was given, only to conquer the promised land. No other place to conquer, only the specific place. But this is what happened. Verse 1 of chapter 32. Now the children of Reuben and the children of God had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, behold, the place was a place for what, everyone? A cattle. So as they journey on, right, they saw this place. And so before, now I just want you to understand this, before people's wealth is not measured on their gold or their, their money. They're not measured in that. They're measured on their livestock. So the more livestock you have, the richer you are. Remember, Job has 5,000 camels, 7,000 ox. He's so rich because of his livestock. And so these guys are so rich, as they journey on, they have a lot of livestock, and they encounter the place good for their livestock. In other words, the place was very good to settle for their business. For their what, everyone? For their business. And notice that. So they came into the situation where this place is good for our business, and we have a lot of cattle. And so they went to Moses. Now again, what was the assignment? To go to Canaan, right? That was the assignment. But they saw something that entangled them. And notice what it says in verse 2. The children of God and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and Eliezer the priest and to the princes of the congregation, saying, Atharot and Debon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliah and Sheba Mamnebu, verse 4, even the country which the Lord spoke, smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle. And thy servant had cattle. And notice this. They came to Moses. And they said, Moses, this place is good. It's good for our cattle. And by the way, I just want to remind you that your servants, your people has cattle. This is good for our business. 
And notice this. Next verse. Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, O Moses, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over to Jordan. You know what they say? Moses, this place is good for my business. Forget Canaan. We're staying here. Is Sydney a little bit comfortable for you guys? So the moment, is it a place, a good place for a cattle so far? That we probably forgot our mission. Sometimes I think about it. And every time when people come up to me and they always talk to me about, oh, you know, you need to settle, bro. You need to settle down, you know, and have all this luxury in this. Sydney is a good place to settle. If you're a Filipino, a lot of Filipinos told me that. You should settle here in Sydney. It's an amazing place to settle. But I realize this, friends. I realize that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That I'm not here to settle, friends. I'm here to conquer the promised land. And people always talk to me about, oh, I need, you need your salary. You need, I've been working. This is recorded, yeah. I've been working for almost two years without a salary. I've been living in a suitcase, friends, without a home. And people say, you want to live your life like that forever? <laughs> That's crazy. I might not live my life like that forever when I have kids, and I don't want them to experience that, but it's a good journey. It's a good journey for faith. If, you're, if you have time this afternoon, I'll tell you more about testimony and how God provides, but, but as of now, God provides, friends, and, and God has not called me to settle as of the moment. God has called me to conquer for him. It reminds me of a story in the Philippines. The Philippines was conquered and was colonized by the Spaniard for almost how, mu how many years, Tita Jackie? 300 years. Very good. I was texting you, testing your, 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 your history. 300 years we were colonized by the Spaniards. And that's why your last name is Spanish. Uncle's last name was Spanish. My last, my last name, Ituriaga, is also Spanish. Because we were colonized by the, Philipp by the Spaniards for 300 years. And these Spaniards were called colonists. Because they colonized. In other words, in the dictionary, if you look at the word colonist, it actually means settlers. Someone who settled on a place. This, these Spaniards were not interested in going to Malaysia or Indonesia or some other places. They were just interested in the Philippines. And so their soldiers came in, destroyed some parts of the Philippines, and set, settled in the Philippines. Uh, they probably saw beautiful Filipinas, you know, coconuts, uh, you know, all these amazing things that they don't have in Spain. And so they stayed there and say, oh, we're going to stay here, man. And then we had families and, you know, with last names in Spanish because the Spaniards settled there. After years and years of, of Spanish colonization, the Philippines was also conquered and was attacked by a group of people called the Japanese. The Japanese came and conquered the Philippines for how many years, Tito Jackie? Three Almost three and a half years. So they stayed in the Philippines and destroyed most of parts of the Philippines than what the Spaniards did. Destroyed a lot of things. But I realized this. Even though we are part of the colony of Japan, the Japanese were not mainly identified as colonists. They were called soldiers. Because if you look at the plan of the Japanese and the Nazis, right? They were not really interested in just the Philippines. They were interested in conquering the world. If you look at the path of the Japanese, they're like Philippines, Indonesia, some parts of Australia, I believe the, the northern part was conquered, some part, Pearl Harbor, Guam. These people were not interested in one place, they're interested in conquering the world. They were soldiers. That's why their military personnel were called part of the Imperial Army of Japan. Army, soldiers. You know what a soldier means in, in, in the dictionary? A soldier is someone who is engaged in battle engaged in battle i said that illustration to say this is it possible that the church has become a colony not an army is it possible that we have become settlers but we were no longer soldiers sydney start to make us feel like settlers and not soldiers but God has called us, friends, not to be settlers in this world, but conquerors, to finish the work in this generation. I'm running out of time, and I need to finish this. But as I go on to this topic, friends, I encourage you, 
not just to settle in this world, but to conquer for God. If God is not calling you to conquer the whole Australia, maybe God is calling you to conquer your neighbor, conquer a friend, an office mate. Maybe God is calling you to do that and you have been delaying that call. Today God said, I'm not calling you to settle in the work. I've called you to help me finish the work. God has put you to become a nurse, to become a teacher, to become part of, as an accountant. Whatever it is, God has called you in the very purpose, not for your own business. Because these people, just like the, the children of Israel, they thought that they were passing there for their business to bloom. No, that's not the main purpose. They were passing there to conquer Canaan. And the same with us, friends. You are not put here in Sydney for the reason of just expanding your territory and to have good business or degrees. God has called you to reach people for his kingdom and we have forgotten that identity and today we are here to remind us in ourselves that we are called not as colonists we are called to be soldiers to help God finish the work we are not working friends for the income we're here for the outcome of the work and we're here to finish the work. And I'm so happy that your, your church is not just a church. It's a church that, that loves to move forward. Amen? Many churches, friends, it's just like to... I, I, I feel sad because many times as a pastor, whenever I work as a pastor, I felt like I'm just sustaining the church. But a pastor is not called just to sustain a church. We are called to build churches. And I'm happy Fountain is an opportunity to just not just sustain a certain church, but to move forward and, and building more churches, amen? amen? Bringing up disciples in this church to finish the work in this generation. How much time do I have, Pastor Tim? Okay, I'm finishing the point now. Yeah, I'm finishing. <laughs> I'm finishing the point now. Um, let me just give you this illustration. Because many times, sometimes we don't have the spirit of sacrifice anymore in the church to just just finish the work for God. And we always think about this income, you know, oh, you don't have salary there, you should not be working, you should find a place where you can have money. But we no longer go forward in the church to chase where God needs us to be. I remember I went to Rochester, New York. The first Adventist Review office was built. It was just a humble home where they started the first uh, review and herald. And I remember the stories of these young people. Uh, this is the, from the life sketches of Mrs. White. I've read in, in her book. I just want to share this to you. It says, we are just getting settled in Rochester. We have rented an old house for $175 a year. We have the press in the house. It says, notice this. Butter is so high that we do not purchase it. Neither can we afford potatoes. Notice that. That church started not affording butter or potatoes. And notice this, we use sauce in the place of butter and turnips for potatoes. Our first meals were taken on a fireboard placed upon the two empty flour barrels. That's how poor they are. But notice this one. Because the daily, sorry, this one. She said, we are willing to endure privations, hunger, if the work of God can be advanced. That's our pioneers. How many of us would say that? Lord, I'm willing to go hungry just for your work to be advanced. We're teaching our young people, friends, to just get your degree, you need to be successful, get money, you need to have security in this life. But, but our pioneers, man, it's all about for the finishing of the work. We're, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through, friends. Notice this. And she said in the testimony, she said, God has made the advancement of his cause in the world dependent upon the labors and sacrifices of his followers. The work of God is dependent on who? On us, our sacrifices. How much are we willing to give for God? How much are you willing to give for Fountain to help Fountain to help God finish the work here in Australia? Or are we just here sitting around members but not soldiers? I chose this message because this is only the only sermon in this church that I have. But I want to challenge you, friends, to move forward, to finish the work. One thing that changed my mind the most is this picture. 
I want you to stare at that picture for a moment and just contemplate on that picture. This is the badge of the Baptist missionary movement in the 1800s. And they used to put that badge on their, their shirt. And it's a picture, and this is Ellen White, by the way, in the book Ministry of Healing, gave a comment on this picture. She said this in the picture. There is a picture representing a bullock standing between a plow and an altar with the inscription ready for either. Do you see that? A plow and an altar and, a, and an ox. And she said, ready to toil in the furrow or to be offered on the altar of sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? And she said this, this is the position of a true child of God, willing to go where duty calls, to deny self, to sacrifice for the Redeemer's cause. When I read that, I said, wow, that is my calling. That cow was in the middle, ready for both, ready to work for God, or to sacrifice himself for the work in the cause of Jesus. Are you willing to do that for God, friends? Remember, those who are faithful in the least shall be faithful in much. If we're not willing to do that in our, our personal life, friends, we can never do that in, 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 in huge opportunities that God has given. And to end this point, friends, let's read 2 Timothy, the final words of Paul to the young Timothy, verse 4. The Bible said, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Timothy, Paul said, you've answered the call of God. You've endured hardness as a good soldier. You're not entangled by the things of this life. What's the main purpose of it, young Timothy? That you may please him who had called you as a soldier. The main purpose why we're doing this, friends, is not for fame or money. It's not for people to appreciate us. It's not for recognition. Or it's not just for us to go to heaven. The main thing that we're doing this, friends, Paul said you're doing it, that you may please him who had called you into the ministry. That's just an amazing call today, friends. We're doing it because we love Jesus. Amen? We love him and we please him, not for any reasons, but to please the one that has sent us. In World War II in, in the Philippines, I was reading an article about this, and they found a man in the Philippines. And this story of a man, a Japanese man, who was assigned in the Philippines in, 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 in the battle. This man, his name was Hiro Onado. You can Google his name. Hiro Onado is just an amazing man. He was assigned in the Philippines to be part of the best uh, the special forces of, the, of, of, of the Japanese. And he was assigned somewhere in the northern part of the islands of the Philippines, a small island. A story was told that this man was so dedicated that their training consists of surviving in the jungles, surviving by their own selves. And they were told never to surrender until their commander tells them to do so. Never going to die in natural causes, never surrender. And they must die in battle instead of surrendering. That was the mindset. And so the story was told that he was assigned there. You know, MacArthur came, right? Remember? And so he said, I shall return. And he returned. And they dropped the bomb to Hiroshima. And they called every Japanese to go back and surrender. Story was told that they were retreating on this island, five of them. And to make the long story short, I think, I believe, three of them died. And the rest of them surrendered. Except for Hiro Onado. He was left alone in the jungle of the Philippines, and he stayed there. Story was told that the war was over, pamphlets was given everywhere. He would keep, see these pamphlets uh, you know, being thrown outside a plane, saying, the war is over, the Japanese are going home. Story was told that he read it, he said, this is just propaganda. Japanese people will never be defeated. The Imperial Army of Japan will never be defeated. And in his mind, he said, I will never leave my position. He was still in his uniform. A story was told, my dear friends, that a Japanese journalist from Japan, he came to the Philippines to try to find this man. He found this man. The story was told. And he said, dude, the war is over. You need to go home. War is over, man. Go home. He said, I will never go home until my commander tells me to do so. 29 years in the jungle of the Philippines, still in his uniform. 
story was told that this Japanese man, the journalist, went back to Japan, called his commander, who is now a retired librarian, <laughs> sent him back to the Philippines just to tell him, dude, it's time to go home. He could see Google pictures, images of him giving his sword to the president during that time, Ferdinand Marcos, as a sign of his surrender. 29 years in the jungle. When I read that story, I said, that's a good soldier. He endured hardness. He answered a call. He was not entangled by the things of this life. But most of all, that he may please him that has called him into the military. I said, wow. That is a good soldier. Today, friends, do you want to be a good soldier? I want to be a good soldier. What about you? I hope Jesus, when he comes back, he would see us in our position, standing with the armor of God, with our weapons, ready to work for God. I pray that you'd help Fountain, the pastors here, the leadership, not just to sit down and attend the church, but to find people that you could reach out and bring to this church that we may all go home, amen? amen? Not the time to settle, but we're here to work that we may go home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given. Thank you for you have not just called us to be members in this church, but you have called us to be soldiers. Lord, you have promised that when we stand for you, Jesus is standing with us. And so our fellow soldiers in this room, Father, we may have our enduring hardness as of now. We may maybe be in a situation that we are giving up. But Father, you have promised that when we stand for you, Jesus, Lord, will help us. And today, Father, as good soldiers, we dedicate our lives to you. That we will not just settle here in Australia, but we would go and advance your work to help the pastors here in Fountain, to help you finish the work in this generation. That it's not about just the income of the work, but we are working for the outcome of the work. I pray, Father, that you please inspire us to do more work for you. Guide us today, Lord. May your spirit be with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bless you, everyone.